Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Judah. I'm excited to worship with you all this morning. Can you do me a favor and just stand while we pray? Father God, we thank you. Father God, we bless you. Thank you for this morning that you have brought us here, God. Thank you for another day of life. We are grateful, and so we just thank you, God. We thank you for your presence that's already here with us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for your joy. We thank you for everything, God. We thank you for your love that is surrounding us. Thank you for your loving kindness, your love that heals, your love that covers, your love that protects text you love that keeps us safe from all hurt harm and danger seen and unseen god we thank you and we honor you and we lift our hands and begin to worship you on this morning for who you are not for what you do but for who you are to us just lift up your words to the lord lift up your words to the lord so god we say have your way on this morning have your way we love you we bless you we honor you. There's nobody like you. Nobody greater than our God. Nobody greater than our God. Can somebody lift up a shout of praise this morning? There's nobody greater than our God. Oh, yes. There's nobody greater than our God. Nobody greater than our God. Can you repeat after me? Say this.
loves us so much. His love runs so deep. It runs so deep. If we go back to the basics, we go to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So his love is so deep. No matter what we do, he already saw all the things that we we're going to do today over 2,000 years ago and decided to send his son because he loves you that much. Can we lift our hands and say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for your unwavering love. Thank you for your unwavering kindness toward me. Jesus, you. 
before you. So we're requesting that you come more into our hearts, God. Overwhelm us with your love. Your love has ravished my
So God, that's our prayer. We want to know your heart. <clears throat> First, we want to know your heart for us. I believe it's much, much kinder than we are to ourselves. God, we also want to know your heart for others so we can see them the way you do. We are told in scripture that we have the mind of Christ and that we need to serve you with an undivided heart. But God, today, as we hear what it means to love, I pray we, de we leave here different, that we understand better how much you love us and we reflect that love more clear to others. Thank you for this time that we get to be together, God, and thank you for who you are. In your name, amen. Good morning, fellowship. Have a seat, guys. I'm Becky, and I want to welcome you here today. And I'm La Rosa, and I also want to welcome you here today. You're a fellowship. We are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and we exist to make disciples. Yes, we do. And if that is your first time hearing that, that means that is your first time visiting with us. And we would love to recognize you. So if this is your first time being with us here at Fellowship, will you wave your hand at us, please? Good morning. Thank you for welcome. coming. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for visiting with us today. Um, we would love to get to know more about you and share more about us. We have Connect Centers on the outside, which you may have passed on your way in. Please stop by, um, get some information about us, and share some information about you. Maybe we can keep in touch, and we'll see you again. Awesome. We have a lot going on in the life of fellowship right now. We start yeah. youth this week. Can we clap that up? <laughs> Woo! Uh, Courtney Lindsay, our new youth pastor, um, had a parent meeting this last week, and it went so well, and we are really excited right here in this building, uh, this room, to invite our youth back in as we yes. restart this year. Um, we also have Thursday night service. How many of you were here Thursday night? Okay, well, you know what? It's because you're Sunday at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. people, um, yes. Thursday night was cool, but I don't want to say too much about it because it was also full. So... <laughs> This Sunday at 11 o'clock is a perfect time for you guys. But if you want to check out Thursday, it's at 7 o'clock. Come around 630 because we have, like, real food. Like, not just donuts, but a lot of really good food. And then charcuterie kind of thing. And then youth also is at 7 o'clock on, on Wednesdays. Wednesdays. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes. lots going on. We're so glad you're here. Yes, we are. And it is Black History Month. Can we clap that up? Yeah. 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 Very, very special month for all of us, but I know it's near and dear to, to many of us as well. And so I just want to encourage you. Uh, we'll have some things going on this month to just uh, highlight some people. But I want to encourage you to, on your own, to go out and learn something new that you did not know. I, I personally, I mentioned this in the first service, but you, many of you know Brian Loritz, who uh, he uh, preaches here very often. Um, but I, every single day, he highlights an African-American who's contributed to um, our society and our world, and it's somebody that I've never heard of before. So if you don't follow him, follow him, and you'll get some, some really good facts about some, some really great people. So good, so good. Well, we know that next week is Super Bowl. Are you excited about that? Some people. <laughs> Commercials. I guess if your team is not in, you're like, eh, I don't care. <laughs> Commercials, Taylor Swift, nothing. Uh, so, sure, okay, baby, speaking of Taylor Swift, <laughs> um, I got my grandkids and I all Taylor Swift themed Kansas City jerseys, and I'm pretty excited about it, but y'all aren't said, Swifties. Wait, you said Taylor Swift themed Kansas City jerseys? Yeah, Taylor Swift themed. She's, she's, she's in not Travis even a era, player, right? Okay. Yay. Have you not heard that? Yay, Taylor. I'm not a hater, y'all. Wow. I'm not a hater, Guys. but I'm like, Taylor Swift. No, 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 Patrick Mahomes. I cannot name a song no. she sings, but my no, grandkids Kelsey. are going to match. And it's Taylor gonna be Swift. Swift on the back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking of Taylor Swift, uh, we want to talk about our favorite uh, bands. Now, we have Usher this year at the Super Bowl, which we're excited about. Yes, we are. And um, who is your favorite performer at Super Bowl or just in general? Ooh. Yes, all, all the things. I would say one of my all-time favorites, though, is Michael Jackson. Yeah. Heal the world, make it a better place. Yeah. Yes, but perfect. That's one of mine. What, what about you? Well, not Taylor Swift, because I all know y'all don't like her. Um, we do like her! I think um, Bruno Mars, when he was at the Super Bowl, was incredible. Really good. All right, guys, stand up, talk to each other about that, and uh, let's roll. Thank you. 
<laughs> I need your jacket. Yo. Yo, yo. So what are, what are some of your favorite groups or moments? What we got? Anybody got a favorite group or moment from the uh, thing? Anybody? Yes, sir. Bruno Mars, all right, big Bruno Mars fans. I, I, well, I would try to go to the Bruno Mars concert, but the tickets, um, like Jesus would have to be singing uh, <laughs> to pay what Bruno charging. Bruno, boy, 24 karat, he charging 24 karat gold. Yes. J-Lo and Shakira. J-Lo and Shakira, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, in the back, yeah. Prince, Prince yes. Great one. I went to the I went to the Prince concert when he was at the Forum a couple of years ago. I saw. Well, I mean, well, let me be clear. I was there for evangelistic purposes. We had like an outreach. <laughs> we were passing out Jesus Rain when the, he played Purple Rain. It was, it was the Spirit of the Lord moved mightily. Um, yes, sir. Brian Courtney, Brian Courtney Wilson. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. I love him. Yes. Oh, all right. That's only a fellowship. I love that. That's just, just like Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. Standing on business. Yes. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. You know, Rihanna last year. That was good. Rihanna homegirl was flying in the air. I was like, girl, you're going to hurt yourself. Girl, get, get down from up there. All right. One last one. Anybody else? You're, uh, who? Who did he say? Oh, Janet. Oh, you're trying to be funny. Look at you. That's why you said it like that. Janet. Yes, Janet was great. That's all. All right. We can't, we can't end on that one. Give me another one. Yeah. Beyonce. Yeah, Beyonce was great. Yeah, Beyonce is great. Whitney Houston, Star Spangled Banner, I think is epic. One of the greatest of all times. Her and like right up under that Roseanne Barr, what she did that time. Like, like. Really close. No? No? All right. Yo, it is offering time. Let's thank God for giving and generosity. This is, and this is why you should thank God. It's an opportunity to worship God uh, through giving. It is not just about songs and sermons, but it's also an opportunity for us to say to God, God, we thank you because all we have comes from you. And this is our response to God's faithfulness. Not only that, but it opens up the door for us to do and be the church that God has called us to be. So thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, and I just want to take some time and pray. We have several ways to give. You can text to give. Um, you could give online and set up reoccurring giving as well. And we also take a moment to pass the buckets in the room uh, every Sunday as we just honor God with our stewardship and with our giving. So receive these gifts now, Lord, for your glory. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for generosity. Thank you for giving. <sighs> thank you that this is a response to your generosity and all that you've given. So would you bless these gifts as we receive them? May they go to the continued building of your kingdom. Would you get glory in Jesus' name? Every heart said amen. 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 I'm going to ask you to multitask while we receive those gifts uh, and while they pass buckets. Would you grab your Bibles or open up your Bible apps and meet me in 1 John um, chapter 4. We're going to begin reading at verse 7. We start a new series today. Somebody say new series. New series. Start a new series today and we're talking about what does it mean to love one another. We call it the one another series and we're going to be talking about loving one one another. If you got your apps or your Bibles, uh, it'll also be on the screen. Um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Here we go. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, period. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world 
that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an, ato- as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is, this is how love is made, here it is, complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. This is no fear, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. Dang, John, you just, (laughs) ouch, you you just coming with it, yo, period. Um, For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Amen? Amen. God, I thank you so much for your word. I pray now that you'd speak, O Lord, like only you can. Would you tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly? Would you turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us? God, it's to that end that I ask now that you stand in my body, think with my mind, speak through my vocal cords those things you would have us say, know, and do. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my favorite movies is a movie called A Beautiful Mind. Uh, Anybody seen A Beautiful Mind? Uh, Well, if you haven't seen it, then, you know, I'm about to mess it up for you. Uh, No, I'm not going to mess it up, kind of. It's a story about a guy named John Nash who was a famed, critically acclaimed mathematician. He was a genius. Uh, He went to Harvard. Uh, The storyline unfolds with him and his roommate becoming best of buds um, and uh, his roommate having a little niece uh, that would become like a goddaughter to John Nash. John Nash would fall in love, get married, have a little boy. Along the way, he would get recruited by the military to do special ops, spy investigation type stuff, espionage kind of stuff. And it was getting dangerous and getting critical. And at a high point of the movie, really, in fact, a turning point in the movie is when he discovers that he has schizophrenia. And the military, the recruitment, and all the work he had done was made up. Those were characters that only lived inside of his head. His roommate and the little girl, only characters made up in his head, not real. 
So he got on medication. His wife came alongside to help him, obviously in love and their little boy. And they got settled in with this normal life, not marked with schizophrenia. This, the problem was, though, the medicine took away John's ability to feel and exist in the world. So he secretly stopped taking the medicine. And immediately, the military recruiters came back, convincing him that they were, in fact, real and that they were trying to stop him because they have spies and it was like this whole drama. His roommate came back from college. The little girl comes back from college. And John, one day, is fully now integrated. It, so he don't know what's real, what's not in his world. And he's got all these people that he loves it deeply but don't know which one is real. The, the culmination in the movie and everything shifts ultimately when... He's watching his little son, who's just a, who's a baby, and he puts him in the tub and then turns on the bath water and then asks his roommate to watch him while he leaves and goes outside. Well, we know the roommate isn't real. So the baby is there, starting to float in the water, water starting to rise, and on the verge of drowning, John's wife comes in, rushes in, grabs the baby, screams at John and says, what are, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? And he was like, oh, my roommate. I asked my roommate to watch him. And she's like, you know your roommate's not real. He said, yes, he is real. He's real. And he's, they get into this argument, and for her safety, she grabs the baby, she gets in the car, and she leaves. As she's pulling out, you can see John wrestling inside of his head because he doesn't know what's real and what's not real. He loves his wife. He loves his friend. I don't know what to do. And in a moment, the music is rising. He runs outside, jumps in front of the car, hits the hood, and says, she never grows up. She never grows up. The little girl... She never got older. She never grows up. That's not real. You're real. And his wife grabs him and she says, yes, I'm real. And we're going to figure out what's real and what's not by how I love you. Because I'm going to give you a love that's so present, that's so effectual, that's so real, that a love that doesn't grow up will never, ever fool you again. Because friends, love grows up. And when love grows up, it looks like Jesus. I am concerned for us as a church and culture because John is laying down in this passage a conviction and a mandate saying God's people are loving people. And we should be known worldwide by our love. But as you look back and watch at how the church engages in culture and how we're known in culture, we ain't known for our love. We known for a whole lot of stuff, but not, not much as our love. This is something that we should be so good at. Our love should grow up. And our love should grow up, and it should look like Jesus. And that's how they know that we are Christians. Not by our theology. Not by our stance on abortion. Did he, did he just say that out loud? He did. Because we've got to have it as Christians, not for your political stance, not for your political pro proclivities. That's not how they know you. They said they know you by your love because what we do is we become single issue Christians and we get these issues that we are known publicly for. Some of y'all were known way more about your hatred of, of Dr. Fauci than you were known for your love of Jesus Christ. Because you was posting every conspiracy article, all that, ain't said nothing about Jesus on your page. It says we are known as Christians by our love. This love that John talks about, you'll, you'll hear it over and over again. Every time he talks about loving God, he's talking about at the same time, the impact of loving God is how we love one another. Yeah. It's a cross-shaped gospel. The gospel, the, the cross is both vertical and horizontal. So it's about our connection with God and our connection with one another. Yeah. He says, if you're not loving one another, then you're not loving God. How we love one another is a really big deal to God. 
And if it's a big deal to God, then it's probably a big deal to Satan. So if he, if, 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 <laughs> if, if, if our love is Satan's greatest desire, I mean, if our love is God's greatest desire for, for one another, then our division is Satan's greatest ploy. In other words, Satan is at his happiest when we fight one another. Oh, he's at his best. He's his most content with the church is when church people don't get along with one another. If we fight and, with, and, with, and withhold love from one another. We, we a trip, y'all. We so quick to withhold love. You get on my nerves, give me that love back. You didn't do what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to make this decision with your life. You made that decision with your life. Give me that love. Some of you have broken relationships right now and not talking to folks because they did something you didn't like and you thought your only recourse was to deny them love. Cut you off. I'm telling you, this is one that we can't get wrong. This is one, and we'll talk about that at the, at the end. Listen, listen, listen to this. I came across this quote, and it was so convicting, and I thought the least I could do was read it and convict y'all. Um, <laughs> watch this. A single moment of misunderstanding is so poisonous that it makes us forget the hundred lovable moments spent together within a minute. And that's why... The author says, I choose understanding, forgiveness, and resilience to cherish our love that outweighs any discord. Our connection is measured by how we, watch this, rise above confusion. The devil will use a moment of misunderstanding to become a poison pill to destroy the whole relationship that's been marked by hundreds of moments of generosity and gratitude. But one bad moment, the whole thing is gone. Don't that sound like evil? Don't that sound like the devil? So God says, we're called to love one another. Watch this, and rise above, grow up above, rise above confusion and misunderstandings. Watch this, and wrongs. Sometimes people just treat you wrong. And guess what? We don't get a, 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 a get out of love pass because we were treated wrong. Y'all look at me real crazy right now. <laughs> Let's talk about what love is. Can we talk about what love is? So that way we're not confused. Because what I love about it is, is love is not ambiguous. Love is not culturally ambiguous. Y'all know how in California, it's, you just got all these culturally ambiguous folks. Like, you don't know who they are. You're like, well, I wonder where they, what she from, who they, what they is. You know, y'all mixed couples have these ambiguous kids. You know what I mean? <laughs> People don't know what they is. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, I, I talk about this, I, I say it's kind of like Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Y'all know how Dwayne The Rock Johnson, he could be a little bit of everything. Like, he could be Samoan, he could be black, he could be Mexican. Like, I don't know what The Rock is. You know what I mean? Like, you just, you look at you like, you could be a lot of stuff. I don't know what you is. Italian? Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Yo, it, love is not like Dwayne The Rock Johnson. You do not look at love and think, I don't know what that is. I don't know what it, it could be anything. That ain't, no, 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 no. Love is, is not like The Rock. Love is more like Chris Rock. Uh, <laughs> Chris Rock is black. Ain't nobody looking at Chris Rock thinking, I wonder what he is. No, he is black. He is black. He is Black History Month black. He is lift every voice and sing black. He is like, he is black, black, right? So the moral of the story is love is like Chris Rock. No, but I, I, but I guess though, I don't want you walking out of here guessing what love is. No, 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 no. It's real clear what love is. Y'all want to hear it? Here you go. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 13. Some of y'all ought to tattoo this on your chest. Um, <laughs> listen, to, listen to what love is. And this is what God is calling us to. And, and also, as you listen, listen with your enemies in mind. Don't listen with your mama in mind. 
We all, most of us, we all love our mama. You know what I mean? So it's like, it ain't hard to be to do this with your mama. Think about the person, I, I ain't even got to say nothing else. You already got them. I can tell. I can see the person popped up in your head already. You got a name. Some of you got several names already. I can see you. He's talking about those folks. Now with them in mind, let's hear what love is. Y'all ready? Love is patient. Are you patient? Love is kind. Kind. Watch this. To people who you may even have to set boundaries with. So this, isn't a, this, this ain't one of the things where it's like, well, I, I'm just going to get abused. I ain't got no boundaries. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Chill. Relax. You're being too much. Like, no, no, no. Even at times, love requires boundaries. Be kind when you set them. You can set boundaries and not be a jerk. Be kind with your boundaries. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. I almost feel like we ought to all stand up and sit down when, one, when I say one that ain't you. You know what I mean? And we just, we just oh, whoop, I'm out. Oh, that's it. Um, it does not dishonor others. Dishonor others. Does that, does that include talking about people behind their back? Does that include gossiping about folks? Does that, does that include that? I wonder. Uh, I don't wonder. I just said that for effect. Um, it does not dishonor. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Anybody get anger, anger, angry quick? Any, anybody in here get anger quick? God says, God says, it, it keeps no, <laughs> it keeps no record of wrongs. Some of you got a walking record in your purse right now. Some of you in your notes app, you got a record. You ain't even got, oh, oh, you don't know what you did? I, I, you, I wrote it all down. Come here, I can show you what you did. Somebody say, that's not love. Some of you keeping records on folks, and you got to release it. You know why you got to release it? Do you know, you know why this is such a big deal? Because God ain't keeping no record on you. Now, c- can you just sit for 15 seconds? We can't even do it for 15, more than 15 seconds else you get depressed. Think about if God kept a record on you. Don't you remember 1994 and, and five? Those were some good years. Can you imagine God pulling out your record from freshman year of college? Can you, you, you oh, hear you out of worship? Oh, uh, but uh, you, you wasn't worshiping freshman year. This, uh, that, that, that wasn't worship. That was twerking right there. Look at that. Look at that. That ain't worship. Uh-uh. That, that, that don't exist yet. Like, can you imagine if God just showed you what you did and kept a record of your wrong? Oh, let me tell you something. God says, that's why I'm loving you the way that I'm loving you because I'm keeping no record of wrong on you that means you don't get to keep a record of wrong on them. If I'm releasing you, then you got to release them. Hello in here, somebody. Are y'all, are y'all kind of quiet? It's awkward. It's weird. Y'all just kind of staring at me. Is it my pants? Am I distracting you? Is it? <laughs> Babe, I told you I should have went with the blue. Uh, no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. You know what that, that one means. Um, it's not, it's not, I rejoice in evil, like, ooh, I love evil stuff. No, 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 no. It's, it's speaking to the idea of you rejoicing in the evil that happens in other people. So in other words, when your enemies have something bad to happen to them, you be like, "Uh uh-huh. See, now I tried to, I had told y'all that, see, see, I'm not, oh, you surprised? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. It was just a matter of time. It was just a matter of time. You, you, that, that, come on, that, that exhale that happens on the inside when your enemies get what you think they deserve. That, oh, I hate that happened to them. <laughs> oh, come on, am I the only petty person in here? Ain't nobody else petty? <laughs> All the petty people raise their hand. Come on, come on. That's what the Holy Spirit is at. He says, that's not love. That's not love. That's not love. Um, 
uh, love doesn't rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That's love. God says we bring that level of love to every person that's made in God's image. Hey, now if they ain't made in God's image, bump them, hate them, hate them. You know what I mean? But if they're made in God's image, and that's my child, he said they are, they are worthy of this kind of love. A love that's not transactional. You know it when you feel it. When somebody loves you in a mature way that goes well beyond what you think you deserve. I, um, in this past year when, I mean, one of the easiest, worst years of, of our lives, we just went through so much change here at the church with our own family, um, my contribution to it. Uh, but then you have other people adding and making up stuff, adding to it. I was just, it's, it's, a, it's a weird place. And I had a friend in Florida who called me and he's like, bro, I heard you was going through. I don't, I don't know nothing, but I just wanted to just call and tell you I love you. And I was like, thanks, bro. And, and at that point of the journey, it was just a lot of just a lot of stuff that wasn't true floating around. So as my boy, I was like, well, bro, let me tell you. Uh, and I started kind of going into the details to just kind of give him, because I was like, it's my boy. I want him to know the real deal. And he was like, yeah, no, I'm good. How the, um, how the kids doing? Right. How's Rosa? And I was like, man, they good. But bro, let me just tell you. <laughs> and I was so trying to get facts on the table so that he could get clarity. And finally, he had to stop me. He said, Bro, I know who you are. I, I know you. I don't care what's being said. Y'all, I, I mean, it moves me to tears now. He, he said, bro, I know you. No one else can change what I know about you. And then he said, if Albert, if you did everything that they said you did, I'd still be on the phone with you right now because I love you. And in that moment, I realized that he's modeling a love for me that's better than the love that I had been giving myself. You ever mess up and just think, well, I guess this is just what I get because I don't deserve, I, this is just, you know, I just don't deserve it, so I, I just, you know. He loved me well beyond that. He said, our love isn't transactional, bro. Come on. Come on. It's not based off of you doing good or not doing good or failure. Or if the love was based on that, can you realize, can you, can you imagine how up and down it would be? Amen. He said, I just love you. That's what Jesus does for us. He just loves us. He, he says, and there's nothing you can do to disqualify yourself from this love. Yeah. You just get love. God says, that's what we need to give one another. Whew. That kind of love. A love that's not transactional. A love that's not based off of what I do for you or what I could get from you. A love that's based off of just who you are. And in that, I can hear some of you, you just go to the extreme because you're going to experiences in your life stuff like that. Really, chill, chill. Even if you have to set a boundary, you can set a boundary in love. Even if you have to step away from someone for a season, you can step away in a way that's loving, that says, and when, and when we can honor one another well, this, this door of love is still wide open. Yeah. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's all love. Somebody say, that's all love. That's all love. All right, let me get out of that, child. I start crying and get in the fetal position up here. Lord, <laughs> Jesus. Woo, I didn't see that coming. Eh? Um, it's something about, I guess I'll say this, it's something about being loved well and you marking it down and saying like, like Will Smith told Martin Lawrence, from now on, that's how you drive. Like, this the bad boy's example, probably not a good one. It's like, from now on, that's how you love. 
and that's how you are loved. Don't settle. Raise the standard of how you love people and how you require them to love you. Like, remember that, mark that. And the biggest culprit of not loving you well, I don't know if you're anything like me, but it's, it's me. Yeah. It's me. I wasn't. I was settling. And God had to remind me, no, this is what it means to be loved beyond the conditions of your current situation. The, the other thing I want you to realize is, they, John says it over and over and over and over again. So the first point is God is love. God is love, and God desires us to love according to his love. Uh, and he doubles down on that. He says this over and over again. He says, not because you love God, but because God loved you first. And he makes the order a priority. And what he's saying is, yeah, 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 yeah. No, you didn't create love. The only reason why you even know what love is is because you saw God do it. So your only example of love ain't Luther Vandross. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It ain't Lil Wayne, you know how to love. No, that's not, it's not. Love comes from God, and God loved you first. As a matter of fact, he loved you before you even breathed your first breath. The Bible says while you were yet sinners, God loved you. You know what that means? That means you didn't earn God's love from good behavior. So if it's not something you can earn, that means it's not something that your behavior can quali- disqualify you from. If your behavior didn't qualify you for it, your bad behavior can't disqualify you from it. See, church, we don't like to shout on that. We don't like that. Because some of you, you love punitive damages. Some of, some of you, you really don't believe in Christianity. You really believe in karma. And you love to see people get what they deserve. You've got a real pharisaical spirit. And that's not love. Some of you love to see the pain come, come along people that deserve it. Here's the problem with playing that game. God ain't a karma God. Some of y'all be trying to say, indeed, well, you get what you deserve. No, you don't. Can you imagine if we all got what we deserved? Like talking about some what goes around, comes around. No, it doesn't. Can you imagine everything that you've sent around coming back around at you? Oh my God, can I get a witness if it had not been for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. It's the grace of God. Yeah, I'm not saying that there's a life without consequences, but yeah, there's a big difference between you receiving consequences and you getting what you deserve. If we, pl- if we start playing that game with God, we'd all be dead. They'll be like, oh, fellowship didn't make it. The whole church died. Because that, hey, hey, that's what we deserve because of our sin. That's why when he says he loved us first, and he says, and this is how you know he loves us, he, he goes to, to, to John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. Why were you perishing? Because that's what you deserved. But because of my son, you don't perish. That's the kind of love that I'm calling you into. While you were yet sinners, I sent my son to die for you, and I loved you first. So that means God gets to define the love. He gets to set the standard for that love, and he then gets to call us to grow up and rise above to that love. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense? Um, so, so the first point is God is love. Second point is he loved us first. Uh, and third and final point, it's long, so don't get too excited, um, but, the, but it's the last one. Uh, the third and final point is, is this. Anybody, let me set it up. Anybody, as you get older, you are starting to see more and more of your parents in you? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody was like, Lord, yes, oh, Lord. And I, I want to talk to somebody. It's, if, if that's you, like, if, if whether it be physical features or attitude or whatever, who, who's seeing their parents in them? Somebody raise their hand, raise their hand. All right, let me, t- uh, Aretha, what are you seeing? What do you, what do you see? Uh, there's a certain type of parent that I see within myself. <laughs> like, give me an example. What, like, like, what's something that your mama would say that, you, that just came out your mouth that you can say in church? Oh, you better. Oh, you better. Yeah, so you just be saying, you better. I know you didn't, all that threatening, all of a sudden you look in the mirror and you're like, oh my God, I'm my mom. I love it. I love it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, right here in the shirt, right here, yeah. Uh, my dad, like, when he makes food, and like, 
Your dad just, your dad just showed up in that bagel with you just all of a sudden. That's, that's, that's good. That's good. Anybody else? Anybody else? All the way in the back. Yes, sir. <laughs> now you've become that old man talking about the young kids these days. It's inevitable, y'all. Our dad just shows up in us. It's inevitable. God is saying, that's what happens with me. Your heavenly father ought to just start showing up in you. He ought to just start showing up. You should just do it. Just, just all of a sudden, just, ooh, that was like Jesus. Because that was not like me, because I would have done something else. But, ooh, I felt, gee, Jesus ought to just be showing his attributes, his, his character, his love ought to just start showing up in you, because that's what happens when you walk with him. That's what happens when you walk with him. Now, listen, this isn't a thing where you just go out and go do more loving things. No, no, no. I don't want you to go out and do love. I need you to go out and be love. So it's, it's a difference. It's a difference. It's not, it's not go do kindness. No, you need to be kind. It's not, it's not go, go do some gentle things. No, 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 no. You need to be gentle. What's the difference? Because if you're doing it, that means at some point you can just stop doing it. But if it becomes who you are, it'll just be who you are. Love is just who I am. It, it's kind of like we got this big orange tree at our house uh, right on our driveway. And Yo, that orange tree, oranges just happen to the tree. Every year, oranges just happen. I ain't never passed by and was listening and heard an orange and they're like, <laughs> poof, ah, tangerine, dang it, oh man. Like, no, orange just happens. Why? Because there's orange in the seed. There's orange in the root. So therefore, there's orange in the tree. And as that is intertwined with one another, oranges just come out. Every year, oranges just come out. What happens is if you abide in him and his word abide in you, over and over John says, if you are in God and God is in you, then love is just going to happen. Love just going to come out. You're going to go to work and love just going to come out. Kindness is just going to come out. Patience is just going to come out. It's going to be natural. So this isn't something that you need to go home and work hard to try to do. No, you need to work hard and try to be in God. And as you are in him and he is in you, yo, love just going to start coming out of you. Yeah. Kindness just going to start coming out of you. Humility just going to start coming out of you. It's, it's just going to happen out of the abundance of his grace. Amen? Yeah. His nature becomes our normal. His nature becomes our natural. It's his nature. It's, even in Colossians, it talks about taking off your old nature and him putting on a new nature. And he's changing the na your nature for his glory. It'll just happen. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's just going to happen. <laughs> so he says, love one another. The, the, in the Greek, it's the idea of habitually love one another. Amen. Like habitually, like, like, like a regular, like on a regular, I'm just loving people. I'm just loving people. Every day, it just, it, just, it just comes out of me. That's why we need to revisit 1 Corinthians 13 on a regular basis. Some of you, before you go to your in-law's house again, you need to just read it. Just, just read it. Just, just read it. Before you go see your ex-husband or your ex wife just take some time and just read it. Just, just read it. Before you go to the office and you're going to have that meeting with that girl on the fourth floor to get on your nerves, just read it. As a matter of fact, take it in the meeting with you and just have it there on a piece of paper. And it's like, Sister Catherine, what you, what you reading? Oh, nothing. Just got a little reference here. That's all. That's all. Some of you just need to get a t-shirt and put it on the front and the back so you can see it and they can see it when you're walking out. <laughs> Revisit it. Sit in those words because that's who God's calling us to be and he's calling us to abide, habitually loving one another. And hey, don't make the mistake. Don't make this about who deserves it and who doesn't. Don't do that. Don't think that you can determine who's worth loving and who's not worth loving. You don't get to withhold love and compassion at will based off of how you feel. I was uh, at a spot working on, um, work, I got this spot here in, in Monrovia that I like to go to, and, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not trying to talk to people. 
You know, I'm, I'm trying to work. So I have my headphones on, I have my laptop open, and I'm locked in. I'm not giving nobody eye contact. Every nonverbal is saying, I don't want to talk or be sociable with anyone. You know what I mean? As a matter of fact, when somebody asks me a question, I'd be like, hold on, hold on. Uh, yes, what? You know? I, try to do, I, mean, I try to make it look like it is, was the most laborious act to try to get free to hear something. You know what I mean? Oh, okay, yeah, no, I'm on the phone. I'm on the you know what I mean? So this guy missed all the cues, and uh, he started talking to me, and I'm like, yeah, 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 uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And he said, so what do you do? And I was like, uh, here we go. Um, I said, well, I'm a pastor. He was like, a pastor? Man, I need to talk to a pastor. So he got up out of his seat, <laughs> came all the way over, and sat, sat right next to me. Now, I got, I'm working on a sermon. I got stuff to do, but I'm writing the sermon I'm preaching right now on love. And so the Holy Spirit was like, I dare you to have a bad attitude. I dare you. I dare you right now to have a bad attitude while you're writing a sermon about love. I dare you. So I was like, yeah, yeah. This is like, so what you working on? I was like, oh, this is the sermon I got to preach. He's like, oh, what's it about? And I was like, love. Uh. So he's like, well, what about love? I was like, well, I'm going to talk about how you can't really love God. Um, unless you love one another, and uh, how you really got to love one another as a direct impact of what it means to love God. And uh, I could just see him thinking about it, and then he started asking me a question. He was trying to act like it wasn't based off of him. <laughs> he, so he was like, so he just, it, it was just funny, he was like, immediately, so I say all that about love, he was like, immediately, he was like, yeah, but what if people abuse it though? I was like, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's got to be a line, right? Like, what if they don't want to receive the love? Or if you stop giving them something, they stop loving you, and then you try to love them, and then they don't even want to talk to you, and they hadn't even talked to you in like six months. And, what the, and I was like, okay, that's a lot of detail. Uh, he said, but ain't it a line? I said, nope. It's no line with God. If you're talking about his love, it's no line. And then he was like, well, let me tell you about a situation. Um, and true story, uh, he talks about how he's got a relative that he just felt like was ungrateful for his generosity and was taking advantage of him. And um, so he stopped giving them resources, but still wanted to be a part of their life, and they just wouldn't receive him. Cut off communication. And he prided himself on taking care of his mom, so he took care of his mom. Uh, and so the cousin started going to the mom for resources, and the mom would just give it to her. And that infuriated him. He was so angry because now he felt like this cousin was taking advantage of him and the mom, and just, she just wasn't grateful. And he was just so upset about that and just talked about, I'm trying to love her, but he's not receiving it. She's not receiving it. I said, and she's just taking advantage of it. She's just taking advantage of us. And I said, well... Did you give it to her? He says, yeah. Well, how can she take it if you gave it? I said, let me tell you a story. Back when I was in college, Dr. Bobby G. Cooper was my mentor, and he was one of the most generous, uh, most amazing men I've ever met, and he was just generous. This was back in the mid-'90s, and he had a gas card. Let me tell you something. Back in the day, you had a gas card. In the '90s, pfft, you was balling. Um, <laughs> So Dr. Cooper, we, would li we lived like an hour away, and w students didn't have no gas money. So he'd say, he'd give me the gas card and say, fill up, and go, go home. You know, and I just thought that is the great, uh, that, I just thought that was amazing. So I would just be overwhelmed with gratitude. I was just so, so thankful. We had this friend named Bobby that was part of our little group, and um, he, he was the opposite of grateful. He would just always, I felt like taking advantage of Doc. And he used to make me so mad because I thought he's using Doc and taking advantage of him. And Doc just sitting here being all generous with him and not even knowing. So I'm thinking, like, Doc, you being naive and you being taken advantage of. So after a while, I say, I'm going to talk to him. So I go and I talk to Doc with the intention to be like, yo, I hate to tell you this, Doc, but you got to stop being so generous with Bobby because he's taking advantage of you. You're being taken advantage of. And the old man looked at me and shook his head and smiled. My name is Albert. They call me Bert for short but he had the Southern draw on it, so he called me Bird. So he said, Bird, 
He said, he can't take it if I'm giving it to him. And in that moment, it clicked. He's saying, I'm not about to allow his manipulative heart to change my generous heart. I'm just being generous. And I gave it to him. So he can't take it. Now, if he decides to receive it through a spirit of manipulation, that's on him. Or if he can't receive it in, which, in the way that it was offered up, that's on him. But don't you allow someone else's character and their behavior to change your character and your behavior. So I told a guy, I said, yo, you're just a generous guy. Your mom's a generous person. You can't control what you give and how they receive it. You just got to give it and let it go. And if they don't receive your generosity, then that's on them. Don't you stop being the generous person that God's called you to be because they don't know how to receive it. Don't let somebody else's betrayal, abuse, manipulation change your God-given heart of generosity. Be wise, be discerning, but don't change your character because, because, because folks don't know how to receive your fruit. Mm. Let me tell you something, that orange tree, it bears fruit for us every year. Now, I'm going to be honest. Most years, we pull some fruit off, but the season will come and go with fruit still on that tree. Now, the orange tree don't look at us when we come up next season and roll their eyes and be like, last year, you didn't even receive what we tried to give you. We bared all that fruit, and you didn't even receive it. So this year, we ain't going to bear no fruit because you don't know how to receive the fruit. Limbs, shut it down. We ain't providing nothing. No tangerines, no tangelos, no oranges, nothing. The fruit tree ain't like, I'm about to change my DNA because y'all ain't receiving my fruit. No, they like, yo, we a fruit tree. Producing fruit is what we do. So if that's you and your household, say we a loving family and loving people is what we do. Kindness is what we do. Patience is what we do. Generosity is what we do. And we ain't gonna let nobody else change what we do. Amen? Amen? Church, love is, love is what we do. That's what we do. Here's the deal. It goes on to say this, and I'm, I'm closing here. He says, the, the part that says, perfect love cast out fear. And then it says, mark this, listen to this. It says, fear is about punishment. It's a reference to punishment. What this passage is talking about is saying, when, when this love grows up in you, when the fullness of God, love, when, when love grows up and when it looks like Jesus and when you start to take on the attributes of your father and fruit just starts happening to you, kindness just starts happening. I would have cussed you out, but, but this fruit, boop, kindness came out instead of a cuss word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like I would have, like all this stuff, I would have been short with you. I would have got you told, but you know what? I'm going to give you some gentleness and I'm going to keep no, I would have remembered what you did from the third grade on. But because God, I'm 47, I just released you from the third grade offense. Praise the Lord. That's what just happened. That, like, like fruit will just start happening to you. He says once that starts happening, that's the perfect love of God taking root in your life. And he says and when that happens, you don't have to worry about fear because that perfect love pushes out fear. What do I mean? It's kind of like this. When I was in school, I was a terrible student. Uh, my homework, I never did my homework. I was a terrible student. That's why I ended up flunking out, had to get my GED. I, I was a terrible student. There's no fear like sitting in class and having an assignment due and the teacher call you up one by one to report on your assignment. Like you were just sitting there saying, when she call your name, you're going to have to give some awkward excuse or something. Your heart is just beating all heavy. You know what I mean? You just hate that moment in comparison to the three times I did homework in high school and when I had it ready to turn in. And I was so confident. That's the word, confident. I was so confident in class that she was about to dismiss. And I was like, uh-uh, Miss Green, Miss <laughs> Green, you forgot to pick up the homework. Because this is one of the only times I'm going to get it. Now, any other time I want to beat that kid up because I was like, we was almost out of here, and now she's going to take up the assignment. But I had confidence. 
God says, one day you'll stand before me. And you will have fear if you don't have fruit. Did y'all see that? So he says, but perfect love means you got fruit. And therefore, there will be no fear when you stand up before me. Because when I look at your life and I say, all right, did you love people well? You're going to be like, oh, I got some fruit. I got some, I got some enemies that I wanted to do stuff to, but the Lord, ooh, Lord, you know you did it because you was there. You did it. Ooh. And it, and that moment won't be marked by fear because that moment will be marked by fruit. I guess what I'm saying is, y'all, this message is a non-negotiable. It's a non, non-optional one. One day we will all stand before God and you will either stand with one of two things. You will stand with fear or you will stand with fruit. God says, if you get in me, fruit is going to naturally just happen. I've divinely created a desire and a yearning and a longing for this in you. For this in you. It's kind of like my son Isaac. Um, um, he, um, he has a big heart. He gets that from his mom and me. Um, <laughs> We would pass, even when he was young, we would pass by uh, folks who, um, who were without homes, who lived on the street. And he would say, Dad, do you have any cash? Do you have any cash? I said, no, I don't, I don't have any cash. Because I, I didn't. We don't really carry cash like that. And his face, y'all, when we would pass them by without giving them any money, would just draw down. You could tell it broke his little 12-year-old heart. It just breaks his 12-year-old heart. And I found myself, honestly, telling him all the reasons why they're fine or why it's okay. Like, first of all, you just need to know as a family, we give and we give to the church and we have a benevolence fund. And our benevolence fund, we help people all the time that don't have homes. So we, we, we do our part. Not only that, but there are several places where they can get food and resources, and we partner with these places. So they, they're places, different outlets where they get, they even have hotel vouchers for, for folks to can go and get hotel rooms if they need. There are a lot of resources. So I just inundated him with all these resources to make him feel better about passing them by. And the Holy Spirit convicted me. He said, Albert, I divinely put something in him that, that, that his heart breaks when he sees it because it should. Because no one should see that and be unbothered. So his 12-year-old heart and his 12-year-old values, which you surrounded him with, your family, you and your wife, you surround him with these values, and it doesn't make sense for him to see such a s- significant physical need to see it and not respond to it at all. He's naturally wired for that not to add up. That, like he's thinking, Dad, this doesn't make sense. We should be doing something, right? And he says, it's breaking his 12-year-old heart and your 46-year-old heart has grown callous and numb to it and you've talked yourself out of caring and out of seeing. So he said, I said, I tell you what, son, let's do, let's, let's do, uh, a uh, little goodie bag pack, little care packages. Um, uh, folks that live on the streets and that work with these folks, there are a lot of things that we just have that we just take for granted that they don't have, like socks, um, uh, hand sanitizer and wipes, granola bars, bottles of water. So let's just get your friends, let's pack up a bunch of these bags and let's just always have them in the trunk. And whenever we pass by somebody, let's stop and let's grab them a goodie bag and give them that bag to let them know that we're thinking about them and we care for them. And he's like, Dad, that's a much better idea than what you said the last time. That was, you were being a jerk. That was terrible. And I was like, now you're grounded for a month. Um, this passage closes, and I want to close our time with this. Um, it says, <laughs> if you love God, whom you've never seen, and hate your brother. Y'all, come on. Um, And hate your brother. Watch this. 
that you see every day? That's what Isaac was saying. Dad, I can't see this and not care about it. That's not love. And Jesus is saying, people that you can see, and you see them every day, whether they're people that you know or don't know, he says, if you walk around seeing people and not loving them, John just puts it simply, if you see me and not see your brothers and sisters, then you have not seen me. You have not. Because, because love and what love looks like, he didn't say pick the top three. He didn't say pick two of the ones that you like and we'll, don't worry about the others. He says, no, this whole thing needs to grow up in you. Charlie Dates, a good friend of mine, he says it this way. He says, love should be the birthmark of the believer. That should be our birthmark. If you're keeping score, that's my third point. Love is our birthmark. Love is our birthmark. It's the mark from our rebirth and new birth in Jesus Christ. That's what comes with being born in him. So I pray for more love. If we're going to have more love, we're going to need more power. More power. Simply put, God, more of you in my life. May we love better. For his glory. Amen. Amen. Would you just bow your heads all over the room? So God, as we close our time, may we close with this prayer. More love, more power. Simply put, Lord, more of you in our lives. For some people, this is a hard word because there have been relationships that have left your heart hardened. For some of us, we're navigating pain that has been caused by people made in God's image. So it's a lot to reconcile within ourselves, and God says it will never be reconciled within you. It can only be reconciled within me. So get into me. And that's the only way you will be able to love through that level of pain and disappointment and betrayal. That kind of love doesn't come naturally from your flesh. That kind of love comes from the Spirit of God. So I say again, more love, more power, more of you, God, in my life. And I'll worship you, Father. So, Father, would you meet us in this moment as we pray this prayer? More love, more power, more of you. Receive this now. More love, more power, yeah. more of you in my life. Allow those words to wash over you. More love. More love. I want my life to be marked with this. More power. More power. May this become my birthmark. More mark. of you in my life. Let's sing that again. More love. More power, more power, more of you, more of you in my life. This is our prayer, oh God. More love, more power, more of you in my life. Yeah. in our friendships with our kids.
more time, more love, more power. Let's sing together more. More love. More power. church of people marked by your love. I don't care what their history is. I don't care what they've done. I don't care what they look like. Father, may they find love here in this community. May we be a people marked by love. And when we go to work, will love just happen out of us, Father? When we're with our family, may your love just happen out of us, Father. In our neighborhood, may, our, may your love just happen out of us. As we deal with our ex, may your love just happen out of us. As we deal with folks that we got to deal with that we wouldn't choose to deal with if we wanted to, but God, may, may love just happen out of us in those spaces, Father. May we be a people with the birthmark of love for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, fellowship. Have a great week. If you desire prayer, our prayer team would love to pray with you down front.